I have a question about that. So Richie Davidson up in uh, University of Wisconsin, his Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, they're studying the best routes to compassion and why do we, um, uh, sorry, and at the Max Planck Institute, they're studying methods for cultivating compassion. Right. I'm wondering why do we need best routes or why do we need to cultivate, in some ways, sure. should it be our default and if it isn't, why do we go to well, less okay. healthy so states? Well, okay, so Richie Davidson, or Dr. Richard Davidson is my co-author on the book and I'm very familiar with what they're doing. And also Tanya Singer is the woman at Max Planck Institute who's been uh, doing uh, very excellent research on empathy and compassion. And your question, which is an interesting context, is why do we need that? And I think the answer is because we don't have enough of it. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at kids, toddlers have a lot of empathy and generosity. If you have it like a three-year-old, like a grandchild or child, they're always giving people something to eat or you know, offering. But by the time they get to kindergarten, kids become very self-centered, unless it turns out, uh, and this is something they did at Wisconsin, you put them through a kindness program mm. where they get re rewarded and encouraged to be kind instead of like it's all about me and mm -hmm. how well I did. And those kids don't become selfish when they go to first grade. So what it says is there's a developmental line just like there is for physical growth, there's one for emotional growth, including uh, compassion and kindness. And the, in this culture, we have ignored it. That's why we need it. That's why uh, I would say that uh, practices that cultivate compassion are like a remedial education, uh, particularly for adults. But we could also put it into schools. And many schools are starting to do this. I was just talking to the International Baccalaureate High Schools, it's a global program, very high level, mm -hmm. often public schools, uh, excellent curriculum, like a prep school. Mm -hmm. And they're starting a program in uh, compassionate systems thinking. Wonderful. Uh, and, and that kind of thing at different levels, kindergarten through 12 is going on here and there around the world. I think it's, it's part of this program for, for, for a better world, Absolutely. yeah. The more we do it, the, the better we'll Absolutely. be. And, and what Davidson is showing is that this actually changes the brain of people who go through it, not just meditators, but kids who have a curriculum in what's called now social emotional learning, which is designed to help kids become more self-aware, manage themselves better, their disruptive feelings and pulses and so on, uh, be empathic and be kind and cooperative. That changes the brain of those kids in a very good way. You know, and good, good upbringing would do that, but we can't guarantee that every kid in every society is gonna get that. So I think the schools, and His Holiness, by the way, his, his last program is Educate the Heart. Mm -hmm. That's one of his, his emphases these days, is this right. kind of education for kids. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that the brain from in the Tibetan neurology includes the heart. Exactly. The whole exactly. body, yes. the whole nervous system. Yeah, yeah. The whole central nervous system. Uh -huh. That's it, wonderful. You know, the, the force for good thing, Dan's beautiful presentation of His Holiness's initiatives, you could say, that, and friends of His Holiness like Dan and, and Richie Davidson and so on, it has to do with the fact that His Holiness, from a very long time ago, has been a, a consistently against religions converting each other's followers. And he's told the Pope, several popes, he's told the Archbishop of Canterbury, Muslim leaders in India, Hindu leaders, uh, Jewish leaders that he feels that everyone should keep their grandmother's religion <laughs> and that they should they dialogue with people in other religions and learn some things but he doesn't want he, he's not selling Buddhism in other words and people are surprised they think well he's a great Buddhist guru and then he teaches groups but he always says use anything you learn within your life if it improves it if it doesn't reject it but you keep it culturally and ideologically within the context of your born culture. And then he, when, he, when he gets into that shtick, he looks at me and he like, he like well, some people can't help themselves. <laughs> 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 he sort of gets into that. But so the force for good thing is the way Buddhism, he sees that Buddhism being of help in outreaching in other cultures that are not Buddhist and reinforcing Jesus if it's Christian, you know, and reinforcing Moses or Rabbi Hillel if it's Judaism and reinforcing Muhammad and the great saints of Islam if it's Islam oh, and Hinduism, of course, it's, Hinduism is really very close to Buddhism nowadays. 
uh, Taoism or whatever, and even the humanistic idea of the secular people who want good for, good for others. So that's sort of how they kind of hook up in his, in his life. Why we were so, why I've been going nuts over Dan's book for several years now. <laughs>